Our guest today is a speaker, author, sexual abuse survivor, and an outspoken, knowledgeable, and respected voice against human trafficking. She runs Beulah's Place, an Oregon nonprofit organization that helps at-risk homeless youth escape sexual exploitation. Andy Berger, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Andy's first 17 years of her life were defined by human trafficking and severe abuse as she was victimized by her own family members. She ran away from home after her birth mother attacked and choked her at age 17. On her own, she wanted to get an education, she married, and she and her husband, Ed, founded Beulah's Place. Andy, let's start with where it all began. Where did you grow up and what was your family like? Well, Chris, I grew up in Los Angeles, in the heart of Los Angeles, a long time ago. And uh, basically, from the ages of six months to 17 years, I was trafficked by all immediate and ex and some extended family members. And that was in a day and age where we barely talked about child abuse in the 60s and 70s. So human trafficking wasn't even a term then. But um, I was captive and I was physically abused mentally, emotionally, and of course, um, my birth mother was the primary sexual predator, and she was the one that engaged others uh, in that activity with me. So by the time I was five years old, you know, I basically wanted to die because I didn't want to be hurt anymore. And that's when I went out to the curb of my house and decided that, you know, I'm going to give it a try and try and uh, get in front of a car and just end my life because my birth mother said, well, I can take your life anytime I want to. And she had tried already. But, you know, in that moment, God met me there. And um, I looked into this huge blue sky, Chris, and it was just so amazing. It was so huge. It was so big. And I wondered who made that or, you know, there had to be somebody bigger than the people hurting me. And so I, I heard this voice say, this is not the plan I have for you. You know, this is not the way. Um, and I trusted that voice. I didn't really know God, but I trusted that maybe there really was a plan for my life. And so no cars came by that day, uh, amazingly. And I went back up to the garage and, and I, I leaned against the door and I just basically said in my little five-year-old heart and voice, you know, if you keep me alive, I'll do whatever you call me to do. Not knowing, of course, how much suffering and pain and how, how many things would happen. Um, but the last time my birth mother did try to choke me to death, I was 17. And so that's, that was the extent of my childhood and my family life. You know, we've had so many amazing guests on here making amazing statements and telling their story. Yours certainly is one that's extremely powerful. And I don't remember a show that we've had where a story's come out of the gate like that. Uh, so for our listeners and viewers, you know, this is a very powerful, uh, very emotional, but a very important message and show today. So. I uh, just want to let our listeners and viewers aware of that. Um, and again, Andy, I'm so appreciative of you being here. You know, sexual abuse of any type is abhorrent, but child sexual abuse is especially horrible. According to the national st statistics that I've seen, close to 95% of children who are sexually abused suffer at the hands of a family member, family friend, or someone else that they know. The abusers obviously go to great lengths to hide what they're doing from their child's parents. Your story is different in that you were trafficked by family members and extended family members from when you were six months old to, as you mentioned, the age of 17. How common is sex trafficking of children by a parent or other family member? Well, it's hard to have an exact statistic because of course somebody has to report it. But I do know from not only the victims I've worked with, but victims I grew up with uh, that I found out later, uh, familial trafficking, trafficking by family members can go on for generations, you know, two, three, four, five generations or longer. And so unless somebody has the courage or the strength to stand up or to walk away, uh, years ago, the statistic was in a family of four where there is abuse, only one will have a chance of walking away whole or walking away to be functional and successful. And so when you think about 25%, it's probably much less now because, you know, our country as a whole has a different perspective on that. But in general, it happens more often than people think. And it's hard to catch because the predators in a family have the bloodline as their protection. I can do whatever I want with my kids. In your case, and I hesitate, hesitate to ask who was caring for you, but instead, who had custody of you? you know, were you with your birth mother throughout the majority of that time? 
Yes, for the entire time, because again, you know, in the 60s, nobody, you you didn't even talk about such things. And if you did, it was more deny the secrets. We don't talk about that special uncle or whoever. But in my case, how would I have ever gotten away? Because as a minor, you're stuck with your birth parents. You're stuck with those family members that refuse to speak out. And the ones that maybe wanted to, they, they just genuinely didn't know what to do with it if they did suspect. So again, if nobody speaks up, ch children suffer. What was the motivation to traffic you? you know, why was your family so willing to hurt you at such a young age and as you grew older? Well, I think a lot of it, Chris, is that there are two factors in trafficking. Uh, when an adult transports a child for any reason, uh, knowing what will happen at the other end, to me, that's trafficking. That's my opinion, because it doesn't have to involve money. Obviously, if my birth mother and father knew that they could have made money off of it, they probably would have because, you know, they they did fraudulent things anyway. But uh, perversion and greed are usually the two driving factors. In my case, it was perversion. And so we hear about the greed because you can make movies about that and it's more prevalent. That's how we identify globally, we have $161 billion trafficking industry, but nobody talks about people that are just depraved at the core, evil, or simply get off on hurting their children. Um, back in the day, my birth mother would have been called a ritualistic abuser, like an addict she needed to hurt to feel good. Since the 60s and 70s, has human trafficking gotten worse, as in more common or more violent, or are we just more aware of it today? Well, I think definitely it is worse. We know that statistically and, and by the numbers, but um, I think also we are becoming more aware the last two to three years in particular, especially with all the additional legislation and we have, you know, the U.S. Marshals rescuing kids and, and just doing a fantastic job of trying to get as many innocents back to their, their rightful families or back into community like we do. But I think uh, the, the current situation with lockdowns, whenever you confine any human being to a small space, if they're a predator or an abuser, uh, that, that issue is going to become much more uh, prevalent. And we know that at least 40% increase in domestic violence and trafficking has occurred. So people who aren't familiar with sexual abuse, especially child sexual abuse, often wonder why the victim doesn't just speak up and say something. Now, I know you're at a very young age. You know, could you address that? And then in cases of human trafficking, there are other dynamics at work that keep victims quiet. Would you mind talking Absolutely. about those? Um, coercion, threats, my life was threatened. For example, the first memory I have of my birth mother was three. And I had unfortunately put my hand on her wallpaper and she grabbed, she had a butcher knife in her hand because she was in the kitchen. And she raised that butcher hand, screamed at me and chased me through the house. And I thought for sure she was going to cut me up, which is one reason I hate movies like, you know, Wizard of Oz or anything that has witches or anything that, you know, involves that kind of stuff, because that that memory stay, has stayed with me all these decades. Uh, so I really believed when she said she would kill me or that she would hurt me even worse than she had. If I talked to anybody, if I even looked at anyone sideways, um, she would publicly humiliate me to keep me in check to make sure I didn't even think about telling anyone. So that whole mind control, you know, business, you're stuck as a minor uh, back in a culture that, that didn't allow you uh, to break out. And the couple of times I tried to run, I was sent back and I paid a greater price physically and emotionally for that. And at 17, when I reached out to a counseling center, they said, well, you have to bring your parents in because you're a minor. So I was trapped, there was no way out. And they didn't have hotline numbers and things like they do today. So we've made great progress in that area, but we still have a long way to go, Chris. We really do. So many children suffer. Every 40 seconds, a child is abducted and many end up being sex trafficking victims in this country. That is a sad state of affairs, uh, to say the least. In your book, A Fragile Thread of Hope, One Survivor's Quest to Rescue, you talk about the journey to healing and personal triumph. Earlier, you mentioned about finding God at five years old was significant. How did your faith and other factors lead you to find the strength to get through the abuse? 
that faith, I, I knew at an early age, and I don't know how I knew this except for God, because I knew that somehow he didn't create that situation, that every human being has free will. You can do good, you can do evil, or you can do nothing. Okay, those are the three choices. But that gift, um, I knew the people that hurt me chose to do that of their own. So knowing that God was out there somewhere, I had a blind faith, and that kept me basically on track believing if I just stick it out, if I can just make it, I will find out what my plan and my purpose is in life. I will have some value and somewhere I might even find somebody who truly loves me. And that's what I held on to. Um, and there were strangers and people that interceded in my life very seasonally, as I would say, you know, not very long, but enough to remind me that I was a good person um, and that maybe I could do something with my life which is, you know, why I went to college and then to law school. Well, you've certainly done something with your life, you know, but to have that foresight or that thinking at, at age five, you know, and, mm -hmm. and looking to God and, and really finding that calling, I guess, for lack of a better word, you know, so many kids who are victims of sexual or physical abuse would have just given up and, and turned down a dark path. Did your life ever start to go down that dark path or were you really focused on that and just getting out? It did. There were a couple more attempts at suicide. I was locked up for two and a half months during a summertime when I was nine by my birth mother, and I could only come out for dinner or bathroom breaks. And so, you know, a nine-year-old kid, that's a long, long time to be locked up. And I, I thought, you know what, I'll just jump out of the second story window at the apartment house and then I'll then I'll then I'll be done. You know, I, I just can't take it. It was such a brutal year in my life for some reason. Um, it was just constant. And uh, there was somebody in the tower across from us, another apartment house who kept looking at me, almost glaring at me. And I thought, OK, I can't have witnesses. I'm going to have to wait till he goes away. But again, God interceded because that, that person never stopped looking at me through that window. And I knew that if I jumped and I didn't kill myself, then, you know, he would tell people what I did and they would never understand. And so that that was part of the if I live, I win. If I die, they win. And eventually that stuck. And I, I just decided I was going to live and I was going to win. My son turns nine in a couple of months, and I just can't imagine him thinking like that. So once you it left home, I mean, it was pure Darwinism. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you, either, you win or they win. And obviously, they had no shot of winning against you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty fierce. I think it's the red hair, actually. <laughs> it, has to be. it has to be. So Andy, once you left home, did you know what you wanted to do or what you were going to do? And at that point, you're 17, you're on your own. Did you have the resources to take care of yourself? You know, was there a spur of the moment decision or was it something you'd planned out for a long time? No, uh, after she tried to choke me to death, I, I tried to run and I didn't have resources. I had no money. I had no family. I had no friends because I wasn't really allowed to have those. I had you know, maybe momentary friends, but I also had my birth father in the picture who is who is also sexually uh, abusing me and things like that. So I had a lot to work with. I had a lot going on, but I went to college and boy, I was driven. You know, I finished in three years because I wanted to get in, get out and get on with whatever life I had. Because as long as I could run faster and farther than anyone else in my life, no one could get too close to know the truth. No one could get too close to touch me or hurt me. But uh, I went to law school thinking, well, gosh, you know, I'm going to go to law school. And I'm going to save all the kids that were just that were hurt like me. I wanted to help kids here desperately. And I went to law school and I realized that that particular path was not the kind of justice I was looking for. Kind of back in the Menendez, OJ, you know, era. Uh, I saw judges sending kids back to abusers, abuser parents, because, well, kids belong with their parents. They never even looked into the situation. So I decided, you know, I wanted God's kind of justice where I could really help people. And I went back to business with my law degree and uh, had a lot of successes and realized that I just needed to do something that would mean something down the road. So as you go down that path that that new fork in the road of your life what mm -hmm. was your compass or you know, I like to call the north star uh, at that point in your life 
I think at that time, um, I entered into a bad marriage, which, you know, big surprise for a person with my background to marry an abuser, right? Um, but it, it looked good, you know, uh, had the car, had the little house, had the, you know, the job and, you know, went to church, but it was a completely different story. And so um, God helped me through that period. And I learned that I would not have chosen that person if I had been the way I am now or when I went through therapy. So that actually forced me into therapy. And that was kind of the North Star. I realized I had needs, I had wants, and that I had things to offer. I just didn't have any guidance on how to make that happen. And when I was done with the three years of counseling um, and the, the, the divorce happened, I just really leaned into my faith and, and allowed God to show me who he was as provider and friend and companion. So that's how I waited for the right person to come into my life. And when my husband, Ed, did come into my life, that's when I solidified my desire to want to do something tangible um, to help kids that were on the street and had nobody except the street. So you leave home and go to college. Mm -hmm. Those are significant events you know, for any young person. My, our, my wife, our oldest, is a senior in high school, so we're preparing for that path. I assume even more significant for someone escaping abuse. At mm -hmm. the same time, those events create great feelings of vulnerability. What was that time like for you? Was it a new lease on life or something else? It was very scary because I was a little bit mentally ahead, but I was emotionally very behind. And so, for example, when, you know, a, a, a guy would ask me out or something like that, I didn't really know what to do with that. And, you know, I was, I was thankfully saved from date rape a couple of times, you know, quick thinking and, and just, you know, quick action, let's say, you know, by others helping me because I thought, well, they like my writing. I used to write for the university newspaper and I was, I was on radio and I did all this stuff. And so, you know, I didn't know what a come on was in that respect. Everybody else was dating. So I had to learn a lot of hard knocks and I was, I was scared of my own shadow most of my life. And then one of my writing professors, he really changed it for me. He, um, he was a great, great professor and took an interest in me and he became my mentor and I learned a lot. And he said, Andy, he's the one that said, go to law school. It will change how you write and how you think because you're so creative. You're out of the box. It's going to bring you a little bit closer in. And that's where I started making some plans of who I wanted to help, what I wanted to do, and then hoping for the right partner to do that with. Now, you just mentioned about your professor steering you towards law school. You know, here you are, 17 years old, alone for the first time, probably scared as hell, not knowing what's going on and what the world is like, because it's, it's probably nothing but pain and misery till that point. Mm -hmm. What was the motivation behind going to law school and, and what gave you the confidence to believe that you could succeed the way you have today? Well, I never had a whole lot of confidence, but I was really good at faking confidence, Chris. You know, I, I had a huge speech impediment my entire life up through college. So I purposely would put myself on a debate team or, or in places where I had to speak, even though I got laughed at and teased, but I, I wanted to get better. I wanted to be able to, to have that presence. And so this, uh, the motivation for law school, I think, was I really felt like well, if I'm a lawyer, I can prosecute the predators. I can, I can help these kids. But honestly, it is a very gnarly uh, family law is horrific. It's very painful. It brought back too much of my own stuff that I hadn't figured out how to deal with yet. Because in my head, everything made sense. But in my body and in my heart, it was different body memories and just I hadn't had a chance to really process what it meant in my life at that time. I was kind of a robo person. I was just moving forward and that's all I cared about. Keep moving. Don't let anyone stop you. So you said the justice you were looking for wasn't wrapped up in working 80 hours a week. How did you no. come to that conclusion? And what about being a trial lawyer didn't appeal to you? Well, I, I, love the, I, I love the idea of judicial law. I think I would have been a great judge, but I was not, uh, I think, strong enough to be a lawyer and to deal with not only the, the sexual predators, you know, in the single area, in the single group, but the, the pressure of being in a law firm and being treated as an intern reminded me a lot of how I was treated at home. I had very abusive uh, mentor lawyers in the different internships I took. And then when I went to what seemed like uh, softer law, like contract law, which is basically words and paper, things I like, um, you know, I saw 
the affairs and I saw the different things that were going on. And I thought this just isn't any better than life out there. So, but I'm not a quitter. So I'm going to get my degree, but I'm going to figure out a better way to use it. And I think I realized that the system was so overwhelming or overbearing. My little part would never make enough of a diff of a difference. And I think that that was what it was. I thought I can't make a difference here. I can't fight the system. Thereafter, money, greed, and politics and things, and that's not me. And that's what happened. So you went from law school with your law degree back into business. What mm -hmm. happened after that? I went and I, I developed different uh, skill sets. I worked uh, in uh, television for a little bit, ABC television. I worked uh, as uh, a realtor's assistant. I took any and every job because I was trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted. And, and basically, I love teaching adults. So I got into corporate training. I just absolutely love inspiring people's hearts, you know, to learn. And as adults, we, we get a little lazy in that area because we're so busy. But um, <laughs> I loved it when I could see someone's aha moment. And so for me, that was affirmation. So I pursued uh, corporate training, mostly uh, a few diversions, um, went through the, the ex-husband divorce thing. And I always worked, worked for Disney Corporation. I worked for a lot of Fortune 500s and also mom and pops. I loved help raising little businesses up. But at the end of the day, corporate training was really my niche. And that's what, what I focused on for over 20 years. And that was one of the reasons I came up to Oregon, uh, the life change, you know, and then also uh, the fact that that's what I was being hired to do up here for a hospitality resort company um, was to do all the training for their employees. And that was exciting. And it brought me to an area where I knew the minute I landed in Redmond, Oregon, I was going to make a difference in this town. Didn't know how, but I knew God had a plan. That little voice said, I have a plan. And now I have the place. I think you make a difference wherever you go. Thank you. <laughs> you just talked about an aha moment. Let's talk about another aha moment. You eventually meet your husband, who you've been married to for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. How did you two meet? Uh, actually, we met through a mutual friend. I was teaching a, a corporate class and she attended that class. And she said, you know, months later, I want you to meet this guy. And I'd already written guys off. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, all right, I'll do it for you. I'll bring the cake and whatever. We'll do the barbecue thing. And, you know, in walks Ed. And it wasn't that, you know, immediate woohoo. It was just, here was this amazing human being. And by the end of the evening, we talked. Uh, he practiced his proposal on the second date. I made him wait till the third day before I said I loved him. <laughs> And, um, you know, the rest is history, but I will tell you the two best things that Ed ever said in that time. And they were, I don't understand everything that's happened to you in your life, Andy, but I will tell you this, I promise I will always listen and I will always be there. If we did what that, just that much for victims, for children, for teenagers, we would have a completely different situation. So that, that was impacting. He is definitely the kids that we rescue. They just love him. They idolize him. He, he's big and he's fun, but he, you know, he understands where they've been too, because he had a different life than I did. So how did you two discover you had similar interests in helping teens? We were serving um, Thanksgiving dinner at the senior center to homeless families. We had done that for a few years, but in 2008 in particular, we had a couple of young gals, actually three or four. I don't think they were close to 18, but they might've been 17 or 18 with newborn babies in their arms. And I found out they were living in their cars. And for whatever reason, in that particular moment, it struck me that we had to do something for the teens on the streets because obviously the baby daddies were not in the picture. They didn't have any home. And when Ed and I left that day, I said, okay, what do we do? Do we get a warehouse and feed them? Okay, well, then what do you do after they're fed? You know, where do they go? Okay, well, what if we put a dorm style bed, you know, system up there? And, but then what do you do after a few days? So we knew through processing and prayer that we had to find, um, we had to get to the root of why they were on the street. And most of them were on the street for the same reason. If I had had the guts to live on the streets, I would have been. They were running from something worse than what they would ever experience on the street, or they were ready to kill themselves. 
And so what we did, we took our first girl in in 2013, literally off the street. And that's where it began, you know, 13, almost 14 years ago. So that takes us to Beulah's Place. Mm -hmm. Who was it named after and how did it get started? Beulah uh, is my husband's mom's name. My, uh, she would be my mother-in-law, but she passed a year before Ed and I met. And she just had, she raised three, three boys uh, with her husband and taught Sunday school for 45 years. And she was the kind of woman where if somebody was hungry and they only had a potato, she would, you know, feed them. She just had that heart kind of like the Aunt B, you know, if, for those who remember that, that show. And so it was a way to honor her. But the other part was in old biblical times, uh, there's a place called Beulah Land, which is that place between heaven and earth. And our kids, even though they may be 18, they're still between being a child and being an adult because they haven't had that chance to, um, you know, what's happened to them has changed that. And so they're kind of in that in-between place. And then about a year or two after we became a 501c3, a rabbi friend of mine said, he said, well, Andy, you know, Beulah is a pure Hebrew word. It means to bring together, to join with God or community. And I thought, well, isn't that just perfect? Cause we try to get these kids right back into community so that they can be successful and know that they're cared for. So that's how, how the name came along. So how do our listeners get in touch with you? If they'd like to have you speak to the group or if they're interested in doing what you're doing to help kids who've been trafficked. Mm -hmm. They can go directly to beulahsplace.org, B-E-U-L-A-H-S place.org. So beulahsplace.org is a direct way to email me, call me, um, look at our site. It has hotlines and helplines. It has a donate button. So it has everything there. And I'd be more than happy to talk to anyone that's interested. Andy, as we mentioned before, you've written a book, A Fragile Thread of Hope, One Survivor's Quest to Rescue. What stories did you want in the book? Was it a blend of your own stories and stories you came across at Beulah's house? You know, and was it hard to select the stories that you put in there? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, we did select four stories. We had four courageous ladies that uh, stepped up and wanted to share their stories with others. And for, for no, no reward, just because they felt it was important. And because at Beulah's place, they had moved on to successes and an independent life that they would not have had. So we wanted to share that. The boys, uh, we don't have as many boys that come forward. It's a little harder for them, I think, still. Uh, they did not want to share a story. So what we wanted to do is give readers uh, uh, a view of what the teens on the streets in America are like. Not all those stories are about trafficking. One is, you know, another is, you know, something else happened in the life, drove them to the street. So it's to kind of create that awareness. And then there's also a lot of my story intertwined, nothing graphic or gritty, just enough to let people know, you know, where I came from. But at the end, it's kind of that toe in the water to hope, you know, and to the expectation that if we do intercede in these lives, good things will happen, even great things. Um, two of those girls in the book, are already in college, Dean's List students, one's going to be a doctor, one's going to be a criminal profiler. I mean, from the street where they were battered and beaten and abused and violated, you know, before they even got there, you know, to being able to be a part of this national community. I mean, that how great is that? But it does take work. It takes money. It takes hours. It takes somebody like myself who's probably been there to kind of maybe lead the charge. But at the end of the day, every volunteer we have um, is passionate about these kids, especially when they've had them in their own home as a safe house. We use a safe house system temporarily. And that's where these kids get to stabilize. Well, those young women in your book had a hell of a role model. So uh, a lot of their success is a tribute to you. So let's talk more about human trafficking. Okay. What is the main cause for human trafficking? You, know, you mentioned earlier, it's $140, $160 $1 billion industry. During the break, you call it 21st century slavery. Is mm -hmm. it purely money or is it more complex than that? Well, I think, I think overall money is the driving factor and here's why. I mean, even if there is perversion driving it, basically the greed factor, for example. So if a, let's say a, a gang, banger wants to sell and distribute drugs. You have to get the materials. You have to make the drugs. You have to find people to distribute it. You have to manage all that. But if he takes his girlfriend, for example, to a party that he says he's having, and there's, you know, 10 of his buddies there and he sells her all night, which is what usually happens. Most victims are sold 20, 25 times in a day or, or a 24 hour period. 
he makes more money. There's less risk of him getting caught because the guys who bought her are not going to say anything. And she's not going to run home and say, hey, guess what happened to me last night at the party, right? Because the shame, the guilt, the pain, the reporting is the hardest part, Chris. I didn't actually become a statistic until I was in counseling in my early 30s because I, I didn't even know enough to report even at that time. So imagine, you know, all of these lost innocents. So again, yes, the um, greed factor, definitely. And we've seen even up to the higher echelons of society, because if I can make money doing this, why not? And unfortunately, there's a misconception that um, victims choose prostitution, but that's not true. Uh, most of the victims we've had, if they were 18 and they were involved in that, it's because like me, they had the fear of God, the fear of death. Um, they were told they'd be thrown in jail, which many of them are anyway. So you have to look, you, you're, you're right. You have to drill down. It's complicated. You have to look at why this is happening to that particular person. But the money factor, we are not holding predators accountable. We really aren't. I mean, they can walk. Uh, for any number of reasons, and a lot of it is um, law enforcement, for whatever reason. There are good people there, but there are also people that won't believe a 14-year-old. You know, they won't believe a 12-year-old. They won't uh, verify the facts. And so we have a challenge. But um, like I said, U.S. Marshals, FBI, other organizations now in the last year are stepping up to say, we need to commit ourselves to anti-trafficking measures. So hopefully that will continue. What are the signs of human trafficking? Are there ways that ordinary citizens like myself can possibly spot someone or, or who's a trafficker or, or being trafficked? And how can we help out? How should, or maybe more importantly, how shouldn't we intercede? Well, that is a loaded question, but let's start with, okay, uh, what do, does a predator look like? The old profile used to be a white male, 35 to 45, with a family of his own living in a gated community. Well, that's dropped down to 25 to 35. Um, could be anybody, really. But they, I tell people predators look like your dentist, look like your, your, your pastor, look like your, you know, your piano teacher, um, especially if they're experienced in that, but also, like I said, the family factor. So there's not a particular look. We see things in movies and and, and that's true, sure, okay, um, on occasion, but usually uh, the victim's targeted for a reason. Maybe uh, they don't have good self-esteem or they, they're being recruited uh, into sex trafficking. So the, tra the predator is gonna try and fill that need and gain trust and get information from the potential victim. And then they're gonna move in and start with the abuse and try to maintain control. So that's how the victim kind of gets sucked in. You have ads for teenagers to do work, say during the summertime. Um, hey, you know, we'll, we'll pay cash for you to mow lawns or we'll pay, you know, we'll pay you uh, to come and help with some photography or whatever the job is or car washing. But when they get there, it's not what it was, uh, set out to be. So the, that part of it, um, but the commercial end of it is, is really what is the driving factor for most people. How we help, I tell everyone, please go to your local law enforcement and ask them, what do you need for me to report? What are you looking for? How can, how can I be helpful? But at the, the end of the day, Chris, if you see something, say something. Most people can tell Hey, you know, that girl looks awfully young, but she's kind of dressed like an 18 year old and she's probably 10 and she's with an older guy who maybe doesn't look like the dad. Um, we just had that recent story of a waitress who recognized the, the physical bruising and stuff on that child in the in the cafe and, and wrote a note. Do you need help? And, and the child wrote, OK, which is actually pretty amazing, because if a predator is with the child, um, they're very they're watching everybody around that child. Very, very hard maybe one in 100 victims escapes. So if you see something, say something. Knowing that every 40 seconds a child is abducted, don't presume that they've run away of their own volition. You know, be constantly in the face of your law enforcement, of your local leaders, but again, um, you know, do some research and find out. Look at the body language. I would never give anyone eye contact. I would only speak when spoken to. And if somebody asked a question too close to home, I was in a sheer panic. And so the body language, I would scrunch up and try not to let anyone know anything about me or what was happening. 
um, the victim learns to be very protective as much as they want to escape. We hear that people are trafficked at large events where there are more people around, like, for example, in the Super Bowls in a particular city. But we also hear about people trafficked at places, like you mentioned, the stereotypes in the movies before, uh, truck stops, motels on the interstate. Uh, but I've also been told that people are trafficked in everyday, ordinary neighborhoods every day. Yeah. Where does trafficking happen? In your neighborhood, you may not see it, you know, but you know, maybe maybe somebody's daughter is spending too much time with the you know single parent guy, you know, with his kid or something. Who knows? It could be something very innocent. It's very hard to just spot it off off the top of your head. But if you look at behavior patterns, you know, why is this happening, or why is this guy always, you know, talking to my daughter or my son about whatever? Who's in my neighborhood? You know, parents are working, they're, they're working hard, guardians are working hard, but we have to do a better job. Uh, we, need to, we need to do a better job of working for our children. We teach them about sex ed, we teach them about just say no to drugs, but we are not teaching our children how to be aware of somebody that gets too friendly too soon or that person that, pull, that opens the car door, or pulls down the window and says, hey, can you give me directions to this and grabs them or targets them for another try. Um, I have seen predators um, that have chased down, you know, a teenager, you know, at a high school and uh, the predator got away and the, the child got away. But it's very, very brazen in some areas. I would say the larger cities, you have more people and it's easier for predators and children to hide. But in smaller towns, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. People have to talk about it. They have to ask questions and they have to find out, you know, how many cases have we prosecuted or, you know, when uh, Jane's daughter went missing, you know, who followed up, right? Do we know why? Did we ever do anything about that? So more questions, more demand for action, making sure that in your town or community, if something like that happens, you get that predator or the, the, the strongest laws possible are, are imposed. So that's what I usually tell people. Find out in your community what you can or can't do. But please don't think that it doesn't happen just because you have nice homes or just because you're in a safe place or you're out in the country. Because predators look for smaller towns and people that are more trusting than, you know, they might be in another situation. And, and by doing that, they infiltrate churches and daycares and schools. They hire young kids to recruit other young kids. So if you're a college boy and you're 19 years old and someone says, here's $2,000, I want you to go get that girl who looks kind of off by herself at this party or at this college thing and, and just take her out for a Coke. And then I want you to invite her to a party I'm having at my house, right? So the groomer has the recruiter who finally gets the girl to go with them. It's that simple and that sadistic. That's a vicious cycle, it sounds like. It is. So the more we can do to be active in our community, even if we don't think it's happening, at least be aware, have the consciousness to ask the questions. And if your gut says something's not right, you're probably right. Better to be wrong and save a child than to not do anything at all. How has the internet made human trafficking worse and does social media play into that at all? Oh my goodness. The internet, for all the good it could do, it, it is definitely a sticky wicket because here's the thing. Now that kids are enclosed and they're bored and they're going online, we had a, I had a situation where I was asked to intervene on behalf of a 10 year old and her mother because the 10 year old finally figured out the password to mom's computer. 10 year old gets on and, and she finds a chat room and some guy is chatting her up, says he knows, you know, her from her school, but he doesn't give any detail. And she's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, and she starts chatting, giving him a lot of information, what she looks like, the classes she likes, all of this stuff. And so eventually comes the ask, right? Gosh, I would love to meet you, but I'm, I'm too old for you. This particular predator said he was 17 and the girl is 10. Okay. Uh, but the girl now is like, ooh, there's someone interested in me. I want to get out. I want to go meet this person, right? Uh, I want to have a guy friend. And so she sets out on a highway, a little tiny 10-year-old, to go, go someplace where she can hopefully meet up. Thankfully, you know, the community was aware 
and everything worked out, got her back, and she understands better now what, what happens on the internet, that not everybody is truthful, um, and there's a reason why mom has this protected. But who takes the time to tell our children that? Who takes the time to teach them? And if it's a single parent or a guardian situation, um, they're busy and they're burdened, but at the end of the day, it's on us to protect our children in this country. Well, like you said before, it's sort of a, uh, well, not in my neighborhood mentality. Right, uh, right. When it happened with me and my friends, yet to your point, every 40 seconds, a child's abducted. Absolutely. And even in my town 26 years ago, when I got here, I would, I would start with my story so that people would understand that it does happen. And I would have to baby step it into, by the way, we should be thinking about. So I had to really work for years just to be able to talk publicly, you know, in my, my, my town. So I've been there. Andy, what's the most effective way to crack down on this problem? Is it tougher and longer sentences for human trafficking? Is it just being more aware when we're out and about and about what our kids are doing online or a combination of all these things? I think it's a combination. I would definitely say uh, when we do get a predator or an abuser or somebody um, in jail, keep them there. Okay, they've taken an in, they've taken something they can't return to their victim, which is innocence. Nobody can replace that. They've taken years, lives. They've taken a lot of that that person's being with them. So definitely, sex trafficker, life sentence, no parole. That's it. You know, abusers. You know, whatever the the law would be, the maximum, always the maximum. That's it. You're done. Um, after that, of course, you know, we want to definitely get the community. Uh, involved and say, look, you know, as a nation, we don't want to be known as the people that sell our children for profit. We don't want to be known as the people that don't even care enough to, to get educated on what I can do or to educate my child. We need to get something into the school system. And that's another reason, um, kind of an offshoot project I'm working on this year uh, through Voices Against Trafficking, you know, my other organization, because I really believe if we don't get something into the school system as early as kindergarten, first grade, and there are great programs out there in other countries, um, we will lose another generation of kids, literally. They will not be able to be our future because they won't even be recognized as the future. After so the awareness yeah, and the prosecution together. Yes. So after all you've been through, all the ups and downs, all your successes, what keeps you up at night? Oh my goodness. <laughs> what keeps me up at night is knowing that there is somebody else out there I haven't found yet, that I don't have the resources to help yet. Um, that I run into some law enforcement or district attorneys or people like that who simply don't care. They simply don't want to believe that it happens and they don't want to take the time to be educated or they're sold out to some other agenda. You know, what keeps me up is knowing that I'm, I feel like I could never do enough but every morning I get up and with the grace of God, I say, okay, what can we do today? You know, what am I supposed to be doing today so I can get to the next kid or the next victim? And tangential to that is who can I speak to that may need to know that they're not alone? Who can I speak to that, that will know that if I can make it, if I can live through all of that and do something, so can they. Because we have a nation of walking wounded, Chris. There are a lot of people that have been violated, that have been trafficked, abused, preyed upon, and they have families and they have jobs. But deep down, there's that part that says nobody understands. You know, it would have meant the world to me if anybody had reached out or tried to help me. That would have changed my whole life. So... Um, I want to change more lives and I go to bed knowing that maybe today I did okay, but I could do better. So let's go back to when you're, <clears throat> excuse me, five years old again, and you're looking up at that blue sky. Mm -hmm. Do you think about how far you've come since that day? How many lives you've affected and helped? On occasion, um, not, I, I try not to look at it so much because I'm afraid that if I ever did, um, and this is not um, false humility. It's just I never want to feel so comfortable or that I've accomplished so much. I don't need to keep doing something. But I do. I acknowledge that, you know, wow, from where I was to where I am now, I'm happy. I have joy. I have a, a healthy relationship. Uh, my husband and I adopted one of the girls we rescued seven years ago. And so we're official parents in our late 50s and 60s. 
<laughs> so we are so excited. We were like new parents. It's like, oh my gosh, she's ours. We get to keep her always, you know? <laughs> and of course she lives on her own. She's in college and, you know, she's a kid, she's an adult. But um, we, we have the joys and we have the sorrows. We know when we see someone hurt, we know when we can't get to somebody, it, it weighs heavily on us. But um, yeah, I do. I look at that big sky and I just expect God to be greater. So I'm excited to see what the next chapter is. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. A few minutes ago, <laughs> you mentioned your, your other side project. Can you tell our listeners mm -hmm. about what that is? Sure. Uh, Voices Against Trafficking uh, founded that in um, early uh 2020. And the idea was, what if we take Chris and we take his crew and we take other nonprofits that are all doing something, they all have their own identities. But if we collectively banded together um, as voices against trafficking, human trafficking, um, then we would have more leverage, we would be stronger. And so we did, we started with 13 charter members. Uh, we now have some media members and we are going to uh, push our add your voice campaign. We would like to get a million voices on our roster, which they can do, anyone can do by email, just say, I want, I, you know, add my voice. And hopefully by the end of summer, 2022, all that to say, if we take a million voices anywhere we go, to Congress, to the House, to local communities, um, people will listen. And so all of our talents together, we had a great forum last year uh, at the end of July, and we had um, representatives from the White House, from the Vatican, from Mexico, from different countries, and we all got together to say, this is what's working, this is what we're doing, um, this is how we handle, and we wanna continue to talk with each other. So we do the very best we can to one, get the information out, educate communities around the world and figure out what more we can do in terms of legislation. And that's what our goal is. Well, please be sure to share that with me so we can put on our social media for our, our viewers and listeners to, to sign up and to, to help wherever they can. That'd be great. Yeah, one of the things I failed to mention earlier was that Beulah's Place was named one of the first organizations to receive the top rated 2020 awards from great nonprofits. That's a tremendous seal of approval for the work you're doing and the contributions that contributions to Beulah's Place are fully tax deductible. Again, mm -hmm. Andy, how does someone donate to the cause? Go to Beulah'sPlace.org, B-E-U-L-A-H-S Place.org, and there's a donate button and you'll get a receipt and everything. And just so your, uh, your audience knows, it costs about $1,800 now to put one teen through our program. That's safe housing, that's food, that's education, that's um, getting them through the first phase so they can be independent. But, you know, every dollar is important to us. Uh, we are all volunteer. Uh, we're going to actually hire our first person this year. We're very excited after 13 years. Um, so it all goes to the kids. <laughs> Andy, you've really been a bright spot in a very troubling and disturbing topic. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you, Chris. And thanks to everyone out there. We appreciate it. And thanks for tuning in to Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. Be sure to tell your friends and family that we'll be back next Tuesday. Same time, same place, with another leader from the world of business, politics, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.